Hi there, it's Sandra here with the Mortgage Center. Thank you so much for uh, joining our webinar. Uh, we are going to be starting shortly. We have almost 40 people registered for this uh, webinar. So uh, as you join us, we are so glad that you have joined us. Uh, today's topic actually is a really interesting topic for uh, the webinar. It's navigating mortgage financing for first-time home buyers. And as you know, we are headed into uh, a buyer's market. And uh, I was actually at a GR, uh, Guelph and District Association of Realtors event uh, about a month ago. There was an excellent panel discussion uh, that I was a part of um, around uh, financing rural properties and what some of the kind of issues are with financing rural properties. And when I was having breakfast with some of the realtors, I had actually asked them, I'm like, what do you guys want to hear um, about mortgage financing? And they said, well, we, we'd like a refresher on mortgage financing for first time home buyers. So here we are. Um, if any of you do have any recommendations on um, what you would like to hear, please just follow up with me and let me know. Um, you can always uh, go to my website at skipthebank.ca and contact me there. <laughs> you could always, uh, you know, uh, one of the things I'm going to try to do today is just moderate uh, the questions. So as questions do come up, or I will spend a bit of time at the end of this webinar, just going through your questions. The best way, if you do have a question, just uh, put it in the Q&A and then I can uh, take care of that. So <laughs> again, welcome to everyone. It is 11 o'clock. So we are going to be start. Uh, we certainly want to respect uh, the people, the realtors who have joined. As I said, we had about 40 people registered and people are, are logging on and the topic for today's webinar is navigating mortgage financing for first-time home buyers. And as you know, um, we are in the, uh, almost December 2024, and many of you have may have already uh, gotten updates from your respective brokerages on what we're expecting the housing market to be like in 2024. And uh, in many parts of Ontario, if not Canada, we are moving into a buyer's market. And we, as, as a brokerage, we have hundreds of first-time home buyers who've been pre-approved. So what our communication to our first-time home buyers is, hey, if you've got good income, you got a decent down payment, and you got good credit history, now is your time to buy. So for those realtors who are joining us today, um, good on you. Uh, this video will be posted on our, our YouTube page. If you don't already follow it, uh, just uh, follow uh, the Mortgage Center Guelph. We have hundreds of excellent videos on that page. Uh, just uh, And we have a special list curated just for you guys as realtors. Okay, so let's get started. I am going to just share my screen with you and get going on this. So here we go. <laughs> Wonderful. So um, let's talk a little bit about navigating mortgage financing for first time home buyers. I always love to start with the basics. And when I say start with the basics, uh, you guys have already taken courses as a part of your real estate uh, uh, designation. Um, when we look at mortgage financing for anybody, wh whether or not it's a first time home buyer, we're always going back to the basics. And I'm gonna kind of go through these five, uh, our webinar today is for 30 minutes. So we're, it's just after 11 o'clock. I'm gonna uh, leave the last maybe five minutes uh, just to answer any questions, uh, but let's get started. So we're gonna talk a little bit about down payment and capital and what lenders are looking for nowadays um, and how we actually document that. We're going to talk a little bit about capacity and debt ratios, character related to job stability, credit history. Uh, there's been some interesting updates with respect to credit history. And then lastly, um, the collateral or the property. So let's talk a little bit about the down payment. So the minimum down payment, 
not just for a first time home buyer, because uh, I do have people who bought their second or third house. And depending on their purchase price and depending sort of on, on whether or not they needed to get money, give money back to their um, to their parents, uh, money that was maybe gifted. Um, you can qualify for a purchase even if you're not a first time home buyer with less than 20% down. And um, capital is the first fee of credit, which is related to down payment. So um, one of the things that's really important for you guys to know is, again, the minimum down payment is 5% on a purchase of under a million. Actually, if it's under a million, most financial institutions and CMHC and the default insurance uh, providers have something called a sliding scale. And so it's something like 5% five, uh, 5 for the first 500 and then for the first 500 in mortgage money. And then it's 10% for the remaining uh, uh, 499,000. So in Canada, for example, you cannot get an insured mortgage for a purchase price of over a million. And that's not, you know, in our area that normally, um, that I do business in, that's not an issue because we don't have very many first time home buyers who are purchasing properties over a million. But in some of the bigger markets like the greater Vancouver area or the GTA, greater Toronto area, a first time home buyer could be purchasing a property for uh, over a million. And so one of the things that we're advocating for as a mortgage industry is that the government lift the default insurance uh, uh, ability to get default insurance for purchases up to 1.25 million. So remember, uh, anything less than a purchase price of a million dollars with less than 20% down is going to uh, require default insurance. The reason why I bring that up is that the criteria is more stringent for the uh, approval on the mortgage when people have less than 20% down. The debt ratio requirement is stricter. Um, the other thing I should bring up uh, forward to and to your attention is uh, if you're a for, if you have clients who are first time home buyers, there are sort of different criteria of first time home buyers. And, and, and the down payment. And what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to actually just do a, a stop screen here for, for a second. And, um, and the criteria is different for, for uh, the down payment plus the closing cost. So I actually was uh, talking to a client this morning and um, they haven't owned a house for more than five years. So they, under the federal government, under the home buyer's plan, they can are now considered a first time home buyer by the federal government and they can still withdraw up to 35,000 each from their RSP plan. And by the federal government, they would be considered a first time home buyer. If you are working with divorcees, they can actually withdraw the money tax free if they're a divorcee or going through a separation agreement from their RSP tax free. Again, it's up to 35,000. So it's very interesting by the federal government. Um, it's called the home buyers plan. It's not called the first time home buyers plan. But with the provincial government, if you have owned a house anytime in Canada, it, uh, you will not be eligible for the land transfer tax rebate. So again, oftentimes I get questions, okay, well, when am I going to get my rebate? So what actually happens is for the provincial land transfer uh, tax rebate, that's a provincial program, the borrowers will go to the lawyer, sign an affidavit, and then the lawyer will say, yes, these guys are first time home buyers and then apply the provincial land transfer tax rebate. So just keep in mind that the borrowers need to have their down payment plus their closing costs. And even if they are getting a, a provincial land transfer tax rebate. So something uh, very interesting to note uh, that I, I, I just wanted to share with you. So that's uh, a little bit about the down payment. One of the questions that I often get is, well, we have actually lots of first time home buyers who are getting significant down payments from their family members. Um, when I say significant, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
How we document that is also very important. One of the things that we do is they don't, the borrowers do not have to have the money in their savings account when they, uh, you know, when they present the, when you guys present the offer and within the uh, financing condition period, because sometimes the closing date could be 60 or 90 days out. So how we document a gift from a family member is also very important. We need a gift letter. And then oftentimes the borrowers or the uh, actually the people who are gifting the money have to go to the bank and have that gift letter stamped to confirm that, in fact, they do have the money. And there's a lot of sort of tracking. I know you guys are dealing with FinTrack all the time. Um, money laundering, as you know, as you have read, uh, is becoming a greater uh, issue in Canada just because of the way the market is. So uh, documenting the gift is very important. The message to you today is that the borrowers do not have to have the gifted money in their bank account. I told, I usually tell them you don't usually need it until uh, two weeks before your closing date. So uh, another important point for you if you're, uh, as you're dealing with your first time home buyers, because they may have issues around, not issues, but questions around down payment and, con and confirming that. Uh, the next thing item I'd like to talk to you about, you guys all know what debt ratios are. GDS is 39, TDS is 44%. Um, we are in a decreasing rate environment. So um, how mortgage pre-approvals work is often what we're going to end up finding is the pre-approval rate is actually higher than what is going to be the rate that the buy, uh, buyers are eventually going to get. So uh, what we're telling the clients that we're working on uh, for with pre-approvals, we'll just pre-approve you for, for the mortgage. Make sure we check out all the five C's of credit. And then um, you want to check in with us when you're ready to put an offer on because the pre-approval rate will be a lot different than the actual rate that you're getting uh, on your final mortgage. And so, and the reason for that is we are in a decreasing rate environment, right? So for example, the pre-approval rate on an insured mortgage with less than 20% down right now is 579. But if you had a buyer that was putting an offer on a house today, it would be 569. And that might be lower in the next four to six months. So that's another important question. Um, and the reason why I bring this up with the debt ratios is how we pre-approve people on a mortgage is the contract rate plus two. So if the rates are a lot lower, let's just say in six months, you want to encourage your and your buyers have not purchased a house. You want to encourage your buyers to get their pre-approval reset because they might actually qualify for more money. Um, there is also another uh, important point. Uh, many buyers, especially um, buyers that only have one income, they are having a hard time qualifying because of the stress test rate. So many uh, first time home buyers or divorcees <laughs> or people who are buying on their own and they have 20% down, I would say the majority of our buyers require extended ratio programs. So uh, if you do end up sending, depending on how uh, you work as a realtor, um, you know, working with a mortgage broker like our office is important because if the buyers have 20% down and let's just say they can't qualify for the mortgage that they want, a broker like our office can also uh, offer them an alternative option where uh, they can purchase for a little bit more. Uh, these mortgages normally are one or two year terms, which is very good. And we can get them, help them get into the house that they'd like or the property that they like under an extended uh, ratio program. So this is very good. This is one other reason why you, you want to be working with a mortgage broker, because our office, especially when clients have 20% down or more, we offer them a prime option because we work with TD and Scotia and uh, like non-bank prime lenders like First National and MCAP, but we also offer them an alternative uh, uh, 
uh, alternative um, option where uh, a pre-approval can be done through extended ratios. So, and then we let the buyers and, and how that helps you as a realtor, it's very good because you sort of know their price range. Because one of the things that we are always uh, talking to our buyers about is, do you mind, do you have a realtor? Do you mind if we share this information with them? Just so you know what's going on with the financing. Um, the next item here is related to character and job stability. And I get a lot of questions I often uh, lecture at the University of Guelph. They do have a very good real estate and housing program. This is a shout out to the housing real estate and housing program at the University of Guelph. Um, I do get a lot of questions around character and job stability and probationary periods and, and things like that. Um, if we're working with a first time home buyer and they're new to a job, and they are on a probationary period, but they've also uh, worked in that similar field for the last two years, we can actually get those mortgages approved even within their probationary period if they've had similar jobs. There are some very excellent um, uh, professional programs um, that we are now rolling out with our clients, uh, especially because my um, office is in Guelph and the Ontario Veterinary College at the University of Guelph is, is just the, one of the most, uh, is the, one of the best veterinarian programs in Canada, if not the world. Um, and they have very excellent professional programs where is, if somebody is graduated or is in their last year of university, we can actually, and, um, we can actually use a projected income for them. And so that's the point. Does university count? So often professional type programs like engineering, veterinary, medical, that background at university counts. So it's very important for us to capture that information on um, on uh, on the application. And so we're looking for that history. And those are the conversations that we have with borrowers. And that's really the difference between a pre-qualification and a pre-approval. We sort of teased out that information that's super important to help the borrowers qualify for the mortgages that they want and get them in and help first time home buyers actually get into the housing market. We do also uh, work with co-signers quite a bit for first time home buyers. Now, we are actually not meeting people physically in the office anymore. And this is wonderful because many co-signers no longer live in the same city as their children. So uh, a co-signer would be a parent or an immediate family member. And because we're meeting virtually, co-signers can actually easily join the online meetings. Um, one of the interesting things with a co-signer as it relates to job stability is they, they help sort of with this character idea. However, if the co-signer has um, a, a significant mortgage or significant debt on their current uh, primary residence, we actually have to bring that in. So I have worked with co-signers, for example, who were self-employed and we thought we would add them on as co they would make good co-signers. But when we looked at their income and the debt that they had, they actually um, made the file look worse. So again, um, don't assume that if there's a co-signer that that's going to improve things. So these are just some of the questions that we ask that you should be aware of. Um, we and, and again, like we're seeing more. I haven't seen fraudulent job letters and pay stubs in a long time, and I'm starting to see more and more of them in our office. So um, one of the things we're always asking for is letters of employment and matching pay stubs. Um, lenders will call within a week of closing to confirm income. So what we don't want to do is we don't want to create a situation where the borrowers are transitioning jobs in the middle of their purchase. Or if they are transitioning jobs, I did uh, work with someone just recently, we were upfront about that. Because if the lender calls to confirm employment, and they will call, up to a week before closing, and we have not disclosed that the borrower is changing jobs, 
it could mean a delay in closing. It could mean maybe not even possibly closing. So it's better to disclose that information. Again, we encourage our first time home buyers, if you're planning on doing a job change, either make the job change first and then purchase the house. Or if you're gonna, if your goal is to purchase within the next 60 to 90 days or 120 days, don't change jobs. Um, and then kind of another red flag that I've noticed is uh, we do lots of mortgages with self-employed people, but this is a red flag for you as a realtor. Uh, sometimes uh, people, what I find who who um, don't have their taxes completed or are disorganized to you, they will likely have issues with purchasing a property. Um, and it doesn't matter if they're first time home buyers. Credit history is always uh, an important uh, point. We're actually hosting uh, the Real Estate Pulse Conference again. We used to do it before the pandemic. Uh, I wanna make sure that you guys mark this calendar uh, date for you. Uh, we are hosting the Real Estate Pulse Conference on January the 31st. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is we have uh, the director of Equifax coming to speak. And um, credit history is always a challenge. And I'm surprised at how many questions we get from borrowers on like, well, how, what's my credit history and um, how do I keep it good? So this is also a lesson uh, and some inf valuable information for your own personal credit history. So um, we, at our office, we use Equifax, the FICO score. This is the standard now for mortgage financing. So in the past, I have got a little bit of pushback because uh, we don't use TransUnion because often the TransUnion or the FICO scores or the Equifax FICO scores are different. We find that the Equifax reporting is more robust. Uh, but just a couple of ideas for you to maintain uh, good credit history and to help your uh, buyers. We certainly coach them on this. Um, good credit history, it doesn't have to do with how much available credit you have, but also, uh, but more around utilization. So when the balances are low and the limits are high, that's excellent. It shows low utilization. Uh, it's important to always pay on time. Uh, it doesn't matter what the balance is. Um, I had a first time home buyer, they had a $20, um, $20 balance on their credit card and they didn't pay it for three months because they're like, hey, uh, it's only 20 bucks. And it, it adversely affected their credit history because again, it's not necessarily the amount that's on the credit cards or the lines of credit, it's that payment history. So what financial institutions say, if you can't pay tw a $20 credit card, how can you pay a $200,000 mortgage? Uh, student loans that are not in repayment history, we have to count a 2% repayment history uh, on the student's uh, line of credit. So, for example, if somebody has a $20,000 um, student line of credit that is not yet in repayment, uh, the minimum payment for that that we would have to count is $200. And I do get a lot of questions on that because where they're like, well, that uh, student loan is not in repayment, but you're going to have to repay it once you start as you're starting to work in, and and so we have to include that in the debt ratios. For the better interest rates, the minimum credit score is 680 FICO score, um, and 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 you'll you'll get better rates with some financial institutions if uh, the credit score is over 680. And um, if you're just curious for yourself, uh, uh, free Equifax.ca has excellent um, credit monitoring. It's free of charge. And just to wrap up, one of the last pieces of credit is the collateral. And actually this is uh, this has always sort of come up. I've done webinars on this particular uh, uh, topic is collateral relates to the property that the uh, person is buying. So remember, uh, mortgage is just a large lo loan that's secured by real estate and the real estate is collateral. So if there is differences between the purchase price versus the appraised value, then 
there will be issues with financing. I did want to just remind you that in Canada, oftentimes, again, when it's an insured mortgage, uh, many of the default insurance uh, providers have an auto valuation. If your buyer is buying something in a major urban area or an urban area, they will likely not need an appraisal on the property if it's an insured mortgage. But in smaller towns, they may need an appraisal on the property because there's not enough comparables that the default insurance uh, provider could provide uh, could use to get a valuation on the property. So, I mean, again, I've done uh, webinars on, on this particular topic, um, low appraised values. And again, uh, the Real Estate Pulse Conference that we're hosting at the end of January, we are going to have the CEO of an appraisal services company come and talk a little bit more about trends and appraisals and what you should need to know as a realtor. So some of the things that we look at is like, can the borrower qualify for an insured mortgage if they're putting 20% down and the appraisal comes in light. First time home buyers um, sometimes are more impacted that have less than 20% down because there's not enough, a lot of wiggle room if an appraise, appraisal comes in uh, under value. And again, we're in a market that's softening, so we, we may see low appraised values. And then it's not just the value of the property. So I'm, I've had a few clients who were wanting to get into a first time home, but a detached home, but their only um, option was to purchase a property that was a fixer upper. So sometimes it's not the valuation that's the issue. Sometimes it's the condition of the property and sometimes, and how we often hold, um, work with that, if, if it's an insured mortgage, we would do like a purchase plus improvement loan or um, have a hold back, okay? So just uh, things that can help borrowers qualify, we've already talked about some of these issues. And then just to wrap up, uh, some um, uh, important points or other helpful tips for you as a realtor as we wrap up today's webinar. Uh, remember, pre-approvals, the, it's, they're usually good for about 120 days. Some uh, financial institutions will only do rate uh, pre-approvals for 90 days. We find that most buyers, it takes them more than 120 days to purchase a house. So um, it's super easy to extend that. When you have a buyer that's been pre-approved and they're ready to put an offer on a house, we always recommend um, the realtor to send us a copy of the uh, MLS with the seller's name on it, just to make sure we're, we're, we kind of dot our I's and cross our T's, even if they are gonna have a financing condition. And also a reminder that buyers who have more than 20% down, and it, when they're working with a mortgage broker, that broker should offer them two options for financing, sort of more conventional financing or prime and alternative financing. And if you haven't already downloaded our uh, mortgage app, it is excellent. It's like one of the best uh, apps. Uh, we have a partnership with the Canadian uh, Mortgage app. And if you go to our website at skipthebank.ca and you click on the top right-hand corner, you can actually download the app. And it's very great for you as a realtor, but you can also share it to your buyers. First time, Our first-time home buyers love it because they can sort of run some figures for themselves. Uh, they can do a quick pre-qualification. And it actually updates, our, our rates are updated in real time. So, and it calculates closing costs depending on what part of the province you live in. So that wraps things up for today. I certainly do appreciate your time. It is almost 1130 and I noticed that there are no questions. So I feel like I have done my job. <laughs> um, I do have a question from somebody. I don't know if they can put that question in the chat. Let's just see if I can do this. Um, can the person who is offering the question put that uh, question and type that in the chat? And if not, um, that's okay. <laughs> uh, with that, I could certainly, if you'd love, just uh, 
you can give me a call at my office. Um, my phone number is 519-763-3900 or just go to my website at skipthebank.ca. Thanks so much. Uh, love working with realtors. We hope this uh, information has been helpful. And thank you again. Have a great day.